this bill is reasonable and why and it's understandable and why it passed with a bipartisan vote last time i hope it passes with a bipartisan vote again and i hope we can recognize that this will move us forward and i will yield i'm i'm sorry i will reserve the balance of my time unless you have other speeches that you have to gentleman reserves forward. his time the general lady from new york is recognized mr speaker i have no further request or no request at all so i am prepared to close if my colleague is I am prepared to close when you are. The gentlelady me, uh, from New York is recognized. I will, I will begin to close. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today's bill does nothing to address the pressing economic issues facing every American household, fails to stop the sequestration cuts threatening our economy as a whole. Instead, it's uh, rather ambiguous. On one hand, it gives, and the other hand, it takes back away. But we'll get to that in general debate. Instead, uh, today's legislation unnecessarily attacks environmental protections while doing nothing to create new jobs. Today's legislation includes a blanket waiver for all small conduit hydropower projects that generate less than five megawatts of power. The requirement is arbitrary and would fail to protect the environment. Environmental danger is not determined by the megawatts produced, but whether the hydropower project is located where it is likely to do damage. A one megawatt project in the wrong location would be more harmful to the environment than a six megawatt project in the right location would do. Perhaps most importantly, consideration of legislation is taking up time that we could otherwise be using to repeal the sequester and create jobs. As I've mentioned repeatedly on the House floor, my colleagues and ranking member of the Budget Committee, Mr. Van Hollen, has appeared to the Rules Committee repeatedly, repeatedly offering legislation to repeal the sequester and reduce our deficit in a responsible way. The Rules Committee, in at least three times, has never even allowed it to come to the floor. But despite voting on hydropower legislation twice in the last 13 months, they have rejected Mr. Van Hollen, as I said, as the ranking member on the budget, and his bill would save and create thousands of jobs. Mr. Speaker, if we defeat the previous question, I will offer an amendment to the rule to bring up H.R. 1426 from Representative Tim Bishop of New York to roll back the tax giveaways to bill oil companies. The bill is known as the Big Oil Welfare Repeal Act. And, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to insert the text of the amendment in the record along with extraneous matter immediately prior to the vote on the previous question. Without objection. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to vote no and defeat the previous question so we can get back to trying to grow our economy and create American jobs, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady from New York yields back her time. The gentleman from Utah is recognized. Mr. Speaker, thank you. In conclusion, let me say, state a couple of things. Number one, this is a good rule. Therefore, you should vote for this rule. It is a fair and open rule, fair and modified open rule. More importantly, it is a rule that will allow us to discuss a very good bill. This bill encourages energy production. We may think of these as small energy products, but I am told that all these small product projects already being held up in Colorado would create the amount of energy that comes from a large project like the Glen Canyon Dam. It's a large amount of energy that is clean energy that we will be producing. Number two, this bill gets rid of redundancy. It is not that we are doing away with environmental protection or a review for environmental protection. That environmental protection review has already been done. It's worth simply saying for these small projects, you don't need to do the same thing a second time and incur the cost, which is an amazing amount of cost, and potential litigation factors that go along with it. If we do want to produ produce private sector jobs, and that is a worthy goal, you have to have energy to do it. This bill produces the energy, which will be used to grow the economy to produce those jobs that we really want. That is why it is a bipartisan bill, and I expect a bipartisan vote on this particular bill, and it's a good bill, and we should pass it today. I yield back the balance of my time, and, and with something else I do, I move the previous question. I'm sorry, if you don't get to the last page and try to wing it. Um, it's a good bill, fair rule. I urge the adoption. With that, I yield back the time and move the previous question on the resolution. The gentleman from Utah yields back his time. Both sides have yielded back their time. The question is on ordering the previous question on the resolution. 
Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Mr. Speaker, I request the yeas and nays. The gentlelady from New York requests the yeas and nays. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. <clears throat> Sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 9 of Rule 20, the chair will reduce to five minutes the minimum time for any electronic votes on the question at adoption of the resolution. This is a 15-minute vote. The House this afternoon has been debating the rules for a bill that would streamline the permitting of small hydropower projects by exempting those projects from certain federal environmental review requirements. The rule would provide for an hour general debate and two amendments. This is a previous question vote, a procedural vote before the vote on the rule itself. And that vote is next. 15 minute vote on the House floor. The Senate, meanwhile, discussions continue on gun legislation with um, uh, Thursday, the expected day, for a vote on a motion to advance the uh, gun bill. Earlier today, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, the Democrat, and the Republican Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania uh, released the information and their details on their agreement for an amendment to that bill which would expand background checks to more gun buy buyers. They announced it at a news conference on Capitol Hill this morning. I'm going to show you that news conference during this 15-minute vote. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to be covering up some people's phones here. I hope I don't. Let me just say good morning to all of you, and I'm, I'm very, very proud to be here with my good friend, Pat Toomey, from my sister state of Pennsylvania and West Virginia. We're side by side, and we come from states that have deep-rooted uh, cultures, as you know, and we believe very strong in that. Uh, I also want to uh, give special thanks to two people who aren't here today who have been invaluable to this process and have worked uh, from the beginning trying to find common ground, and that is uh, Senator Chuck Schumer my good friend and my dear friend uh, Mark Kirk. Uh, Mark has been with me from the beginning and uh, has never left and, and, and Chuck and his staff and, and all of them who've worked so hard, I thank everybody because Pat will tell you, the staffs do yeoman's job. Um, I also want to thank Tom Coburn. Uh, Tom uh, has been invaluable to the process also coming from the culture we come from and has had great input uh, all the way through this process. I want to make it clear from the start uh, that this is a start and it's uh, not the end of our work. Uh, we still have a lot to do. Uh, we have an agreement, Pat and I have an agreement uh, with uh, Senator Kirk and Senator Schumer. Uh, we have an agreement uh, on an amendment to prevent criminals and the mentally ill and insane from getting firearms and harming people. That's extremely important for all of us. Uh, also, uh, we agree that we need a commission on mass violence. And this commission is going to be made up with people with expertise. People who have expertise in guns, people who have expertise in mental illness, people who have expertise in school safety, and people who have expertise in video violence. We have a culture of violence, and we have a whole generation who basically has been desensitized. And if you go around and talk to the young people today, it just is what it is. And we've got to find out how we can change and reverse that. We also need to protect legal gun owners legal gun owners like myself and Pat who basically uh, cherish the Second Amendment rights that we have. And we have done that also. But today is just the start of a healthy debate that must end with the Senate and House hopefully passing these common sense measures and the President signing it into law. Back home where I come from we have common sense, we have nonsense, and now we have gun sense. And that's what we're talking about. The events at Newtown Truly, the events at Newtown changed us all. It changed our, our country, our communities, our towns, and it changed our hearts and minds. This amendment won't ease the pain. It will not ease the pain of the families who lost their children on that horrible day. But nobody here, and I mean not one of us, in this great, great uh, capital of ours, uh, with a good conscience, could sit by and not try to prevent a day like that from happening again. And I think that's what we're doing. Americans on both sides of the uh, debate can and must find common ground. That's what Pat and I have been working on and what we've been able to do. Today's agreement is a first step in a common ground that all of us agree is crucial. 
to keep guns out of dangerous hands and to keep our children safe. Uh, this is a bipartisan uh, movement. It's a bipartisan amendment, and uh, we all know that a bipartisan solution is a lasting solution. But nobody here in good conscience could set by and not try to prevent a day uh, that has happened at Newtown from ever happening again. Um, I can't say enough about uh, my friend, uh, Pat Toomey, uh, and I just appreciate him so much for working as hard and his staff doing what they've done and for us all coming together today. So with that, I'd like to introduce to you my dear friend, Pat Toomey, from the great state of Pennsylvania. Pat? Thank you very much, Senator Manchin. Uh, I, I, too, uh, want to commend Senator Manchin for the great work that he's uh, put in for a long time on this. Our staffs have worked very hard as well, and I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure working for you. We're going to continue to work together, uh, I hope, on many things. I also want to mention the terrific work that Senator Kirk has done on this. He's really been an invaluable asset and a very, very important voice in this discussion, and I appreciate that. And let me say, you know, Pennsylvania has a long bipartisan tradition of supporting gun rights, and I've been proud to be a part of that tradition, and I continue to be. I'm a gun owner, and the rights that are enshrined in the Second Amendment are very, very important to me personally, as I know they are to so many people across Pennsylvania. My record shows this. Uh, I've got to tell you candidly, I don't consider criminal background checks to be gun control. I think it's just common sense. If you pass a criminal background check, you get to buy a gun. It's no problem. It's the people who fail a criminal or a mental health background check that we don't want having guns. Now, in my time in public life, I've not taken a very high profile role on this issue. Um, I spend most of my time and energy focusing on policies that will help generate economic growth and job creation and put us on a sustainable fiscal path. That has been my focus. It will continue to be my focus. So let me explain to you why I'm standing here today with Senator Manchin. I'm here because over the last few months, uh, several things became apparent to me. First is that gun legislation appeared destined to reach the Senate floor. It's not something that I sought, but it's something that I, I think is inevitable. Second thing is it became apparent that there are a number of gun control proposals that I think actually would infringe Second Amendment rights. And I will tell you categorically that nothing in our amendment prevents the ownership of guns by any lawful person, and I wouldn't support it if it did. But what also became apparent to me in the course of this debate, there was the danger that we might end up accomplishing nothing and not making progress where we could. So that's when I started talking with Senator Manchin and Senator Kirk and others to see if we might be able to find a place where there's some common ground. And I think we found it. And the common ground rests on a simple proposition, and that is that criminals and the dangerously mentally ill shouldn't have guns. I don't know anyone who disagrees with that premise from either political party or whatever folks' views might be on broader gun rights issues. So if we start with the notion that dangerous criminals and dangerously mentally ill people shouldn't have guns, the question is, how can we accomplish that? Now, background checks are not a cure-all by any means, but they can be helpful. In the 10-year period from 1999 to 2009, 1.8 million gun sales were blocked by the current background check system because people were not qualified to own a gun. Now, I've supported background checks in the past. I support them now. They already exist, of course, for the purchase of guns from licensed dealers. In Pennsylvania, in fact, they already exist for all handgun purchases. If it passes, what our measure will do, it'll, it'll expand background checks to purchases of firearms at gun shows and over the Internet. It would not require record keeping by any private citizens. Now, the fact is the national law that we have had and Pennsylvania's experience have done nothing to restrict the lawful ownership of guns by law-abiding citizens, and neither will our amendment. The worries that we hear sometimes about background checks leading to an erosion of our Second Amendment rights, it simply hasn't happened, and we've got to make sure that it doesn't. I also should point out, as Senator Manchin did, that this amendment is a genuine compromise. In addition to expanding background checks, it includes a number of measures that help to secure Second Amendment rights of gun owners. Uh, some items that gun owners have long sought. The bottom line for me is this. You know, 
if expanding background checks to include gun shows and internet sales can reduce the likelihood of criminals and mentally ill people from getting guns and we can do it in a fashion that does not infringe on the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens, then we should do it. And in this amendment, I think we do. Thanks very much. What we'll do is we'll take some questions and you can direct them however you want to direct them. Uh, Senator, uh, can you tell us how you have communicated with the NRA, what discussions you've had, and do you expect they will have an opinion, supportive or not supportive of your amendment? I can't speak for the NRA, but yes, we've been in constant, I've been in constant dialogue, and I'm sure that Pat has too. Uh, we've taken all sides into consideration. You know, when you have Senator Schumer coming to the table, wanting to see something progressively turn, uh, to move in the right direction, and, uh, uh, and also the direction he may come from, but be able to work and sit down with us and with me from the beginning, have Mark Kirk sit down from the beginning and work through, have the NRA sitting there, all people on all sides of the gun issue, knowing that all, and what Pat has said, is all we're trying to do is basically saying that if you go to a gun store today, you're subjected to a background check. Uh, basically, a lot of the states haven't done the work they should have done. We're going to make sure they do. There's incentives and there's penalties. And then next of all, if you go to a gun show, you'll be treated the same as if you went to a gun store, subjected to a background check. And then if you go online, you'll be subjected the same as you are if you buy a gun online in another state. So those are all the things we're doing. But yes, we brought everybody to the table. Yes, we've spoken to the NRA. And I cannot tell you what their position is, but I can tell you we've done the things that Pat just said we did. We strengthened, basically, the rights of law-abiding gun owners like myself and Pat to be able to exercise our Second Amendment right. But we've also, I think, done a tremendous favor and, 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 and uh, to the citizens of our great country on background checks, expanding them to keep people's guns from people that shouldn't have them. People have been criminally adjudicated, I mean criminally adjudicated and mentally adjudicated. Senator, are you worried that uh, you are doing this, uh, Senator Timmy, that you're doing this and you could uh, risk your A rating from the NRA? Does that matter to you? Um, you know, what matters to me is doing the right thing and I think this is the right thing. And I, I think most Pennsylvanians will agree that making it more difficult for criminals and mentally ill people to obtain guns is the right thing to do. Securing the rights of law-abiding citizens is also the right thing to do. So that's what's most important to me. Senator, do you have any assurances that your rating will not change? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say. Can I ask you, are you going to get more Republicans on this amendment beyond yourself and Senator Kirk? Do you believe you can attract other Republicans? Uh, you know, I've, I've had conversations with uh, several of my uh, colleagues on both sides of the aisle, um, but I, I can't speak for them yet. I think it's too soon to know uh, how people are going to vote on this. Hold on, right to you, I'll come right to you. Do you have uh, confirmation from Senator Reid that cement will indeed be included in the bill that gets on the floor? We, we, have, we have been uh, promised and confirmed that our amendment will be the first amendment that goes on the bill. Okay, and, and secondly, does, does this inclusion of this amendment in the bill guarantee that at least the two of you will vote for this bill on final passage and will encourage others to do so? I intend to support it with this. I cannot support it without the amendment that Pat and I have worked on. Uh, I, I don't uh, predict how I'm going to vote on a measure that isn't defined yet. And since this might very well, and I hope it will be, an open amendment process, I don't know which amendments will succeed or yeah. fail, so I'll make my final judgment when I see the, the final product. Can you talk about what the reaction has been to your plan from your fellow Republicans? What have they said to you? Um, well, it, it's ranged. I mean, there are some people that um, are very interested in learning more, and they're interested, and they are openly considering whether they might uh, embrace this approach. Others are not very interested. It kind of runs the gamut. Right back here. Are you exempting all private sales or just some private sales? So, in other words, if two people who don't know each other, can they transfer a gun without that? Let me make it very clear. What we have done, if you go to a gun show, that's tight. You have to do all background checks and have to be recorded with an FFL, a federal firearms licensed dealer. The same as you do if you go to the gun store, who that would be a licensed dealer. If you go online, the same. Other than that, no. Personal transfers are not touched whatsoever. All personal transfers are not touched whatsoever. We've done these two, and we've done them and done them right. 
Can I follow up on that? Yes. Um, Senator Toomey, you mentioned that there were items in there that were expanding gun rights, and I right. want to hear more about that. I, I'm, the way I would characterize it is securing uh, gun rights. I think we've distributed a list. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, it occasionally happens that a, a law-abiding citizen who has every legal right to own a weapon is transporting it from one state to another. Maybe he's going hunting. Yeah. Maybe he's bringing it to, a, to his son or daughter. He's transporting it in the proper fashion, but he has to trans, transit a state that might require a license, for instance. He doesn't have a license in that state. And sometimes that person, maybe he has to stop for gas or stay overnight in a hotel. That person shouldn't be subject to criminal prosecution when he is doing something that's really completely lawful. A second example I'll give you, and there are others. Uh, current law forbids active duty military personnel from buying a gun in their own state. I think that's terrible policy, frankly. They are only permitted to buy a gun in the state in which they are stationed. What we would do is we would change that, and we would allow an active duty military folks to buy a gun in their home state. So that's just two examples. There are others. I have right back here, and I'll be right here. Uh, both senators, uh, in the past you've expressed uh, and you've worked for national concealed carry reciprocity. You've touched upon a little bit, Senator Toomey. Is this the first step towards national reciprocity for concealed carry for you? Yes. Yes. I, I support it. I hope we get there. Um, it Let's gives us a better it. control, if you will. It really gives us much better control. And basically, it treats people fair. You can't look. If Pat and I and so many of you all who are probably law-abiding, legal gun owners and enjoy going hunting and shooting like we do, we can't assume that people, because we enjoy that, um, uh, the Second Amendment rights that we have, that there's something wrong. But we will make sure we do it in a safe manner and we treat, and we'll treat it fairly. With that, this goal is to make sure that the people that shouldn't have them are not going to be, have access to the guns through a gun show, an internet sales, or as a gun store that we do now. And so there would be a process for, like, there's about 700 people picked up in LaGuardia and JFK airports who inadvertently are carrying guns as they travel. This bill would create a mechanism so that they wouldn't be caught in that trap? Well, if they have, if they have a permit to carry, and they go through a much extensive background check to get a permit to carry, concealed carry, then they would be treated as law-abiding citizens and not as criminals just because they happen to have it and be in a state that doesn't accept that. Uh, I'm sorry, right? What, what do you think the prospects are for this amendment on the Senate floor? And, and should the Senate pass something, what are the prospects in the House? Um, my answer is I don't know. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the debate. Uh, I'm hopeful, but um, I think this is a fluid situation and it's hard to predict. Let me just say this. I have spoken this morning with all of my friends in the gun, in the gun state of West Virginia, the gun culture of West Virginia, the people who uh, appreciate and, and enjoy the rights that they have. And I explain by detail what the bill does. And I think I have support from who would be the most critical gun advocates as anybody in the country. They understand this is common sense. This is gun sense. We're not infringing on their rights as an individual citizen. But basically, if you're going to go to a gun show, you should be subjected the same as if you went to the gun store. If you're going to go online, you should be the same as if you bought the gun across line, state lines, the same as if you were in state, interstate versus interstate. All we're saying, this makes sense. And also having a commission on mass violence. Talk to your children who are watching video, these video games today. Uh, talk to the people at Newtown, basically, if, and I go all over, if we'd have had just bulletproof glass, could we have prevented? These are things we never took in consideration before. There's so many things for school safety and video violence and mental illness. Why aren't we treating mental illness? Why are we having That's that? That's like Colby. Yeah. That's the last question. Can I tell you, yeah. if you reached out to any House Republicans, perhaps some of the Republicans in Philadelphia suburbs of the Lehigh Valley about supporting this amendment? I have had several conversations with some of our House colleagues, and I know there are a substantial number of House Republicans that are supportive of this general approach. Of course, they want to look at the specifics of the legislation, but there are definitely Republicans in the House who support this. Why Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll be talking to you all.
And you can watch that news conference with Senators Manchin and Toomey and also read their proposed amendment on our website at cspan.org. Back live to the House floor, this is the pre uh, previous question vote on a bill, the rule for a bill that would streamline the permitting of small hydropower plants, streamlining, uh, keeping them exempt from federal environmental review requirements. It's been a 15-minute vote. Back to the Manchin-Toomey agreement, the Associated Press says that currently the background check system covers sales only by licensed gun dealers. Their compromise would apply the system to all commercial sales, such as transactions at gun shows and online. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Alex Bolton with The Hill tweets that Senator Tom Coburn says Manchin-Toomey background checks plan is not effective because buyer can wait to contact non-dealer seller after their gun show. That's from Alex Bolton of The Hill. On the Senate floor, Senator Mike Lee of Utah said he'll resist allowing a motion to proceed on gun control legislation. Here's what he said earlier today. Madam President. Senator from Utah. I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be suspended. Without objection. Madam President, for several weeks now, Washington and the rest of the country have been debating several new gun control proposals. Along with a number of my colleagues, including the minority leader, I've declared my intention to resist an immediate vote on any new restrictions that would serve primarily to limit the freedoms of law-abiding citizens rather than reduce violent crime in America. Unfortunately, the current gun control proposals would do just that. More than two weeks ago, we informed the majority leader that we will exercise our procedural right to require a 60-vote threshold in order to bring this legislation to the floor. We've taken this step or under our Senate rules of procedure for three principal reasons. First. The Senate serves an important function in our republic by encouraging deliberation and making it more difficult for a temporary majority to impose its will unilaterally. Unlike the House of Representatives, the Senate's rules and procedures allow for meaningful debate and help ensure that a bare majority of senators cannot impose controversial le legislation on the American people without robust debate, discussion, and broad-based and bipartisan consensus. Contrary to the statements made by the President and by some of my friends across the aisle, and even a few from within my own caucus, we have no intention of preventing debate or votes. Quite the opposite. By objecting to the motion to proceed, we guarantee that the Senate and the American people would have at least three additional days to assess and evaluate exactly how this particular bill might affect the rights of law-abiding citizens and whether or not it might have any significant impact on violent crime. Already, we've seen consensus against passing any new gun legislation, at least not without broad bipartisan support. During the recent budget debate, I offered an amendment to establish a two-thirds vote requirement for the passage of any new gun legislation. Six Democratic senators voted with a nearly united Republican caucus to support by am my amendment by a vote of 50 to 49. That vote demonstrated that a bare majority of senators, including at least six Democrats, believe that new gun legislation should have broad bipartisan support in the Senate before it's passed and before it has the opportunity to become law. A 60-vote threshold will help ensure that new gun laws aren't forced through the Senate with the narrow support of just one party. Second, this debate is about a lot more than just magazine clips and pistol grips. It's about the purpose of the Second Amendment and why our constitutionally protected right to self-defense is an essential part of self-government. At its core, the Second Amendment helps ensure that individuals and local communities can serve as the first line of defense against threats to our persons and our property. Any limitation on this fundamental right of self-defense makes us more dependent on our government for our own protection. Government can't be everywhere at all times. So the practical effect of limiting our individual rights is to make us less safe. This is deeply troubling to many Americans. Any legislation that would restrict our basic right to self-defense 
deserves serious and open debate. Further, as we've seen just today, Washington sometimes prefers to negotiate backroom deals made in secret far from the eyes of the American people rather than engaging in thorough, open, and transparent debate right here on the Senate floor. The day before the majority leader has set the vote to proceed, uh, the, the bill's critical components uh, uh, are, are still not there. Uh, right before we have set the vote for the motion to proceed to the bill, we still don't know what these critical components look like. We have no legislative text to evaluate the so-called compromise language on background checks, and we have no sense of what amendments, if any amendments at all, might be allowed to be offered. So requiring a 60-vote threshold helps us solve some of these problems, and, and it helps us ensure that we have a meaningful debate rather than a series of backroom deals to push such controversial legislation through Congress with solely a bare majority to back it up. Finally, many of the provisions that we expect to see in the bill are both constitutionally problematic and would serve primarily to limit the freedoms of law-abiding American citizens. Some of the proposals, like for example, universal background checks, would allow the federal government to surveil law-abiding citizens who exercise their constitutional rights. One of the provisions we ex expect to see in the bill, based on what we saw in the Judiciary Committee on which I sit, would allow the Attorney General of the United States to promulgate regulations that could lead to a national registry system for guns, something my constituents in Utah are very concerned about, and understandably so. You see, the federal government has no business monitoring where or how often you go to church, what books and newspapers you read, who you vote for, your health conditions, what you eat for breakfast, and the details of your private life, including your lawful exercise of rights protected by the Second Amendment and other provisions of the Bill of Rights. Such limitations may, of course, at times, make it harder for the government to do what it feels like it needs to do. But we have to remember, the Constitution was not written to maximize or protect the convenience of our government. The Constitution was written to protect individual liberty, and thankfully so. We must not narrow the application of constitutional protections in haste, nor should we allow a bare majority to jeopardize basic rights of the American people. The previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The resolution is adopted. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Michigan seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I would ask unanimous consent that the Committee on House Administration be discharged from further consideration of House Resolution 142, and I would ask for its immediate consideration in the House. House will be in order. The House will come to order. The clerk will report the title of the resolution. House Resolution 142, Resolved. Section 1, Election of Members to Joint Committee of Congress on the Library and Joint Committee on Printing. A, Joint Committee on, of Congress on the Library. The following members are hereby elected to the Joint Committee of Congress on the Library to serve the Chair of the Committee on House Administration and the Chair of the Subcommittee on the Legislative Branch of the Committee on Appropriations. One, Mr. Harper. Two, Mr. Brady of Pennsylvania. Three, Ms. Zoe Lofgren of California. B, Joint Committee on Printing. The following members are hereby elected to the Joint Committee on Printing to serve with the Chair of the Committee on House Administration. One, Mr. Harper. Two, Mr. Nugent. Three, Mr. Brady of Pennsylvania. And four, Mr. Vargas. Is there objection to consideration of the resolution? Without objection, the resolution is agreed to in the, 
and the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. What purpose does the gentlelady from Michigan seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I would also ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remark and to include extraneous materials on House Resolution 142. Without objection. Does the gentleman from Pennsylvania seek recognition? I ask unanimous consent to withdraw Mr. Adrian Smith of Nebraska as a co-sponsor of H.R. 1175. Without objection. So ordered. What purpose does the gentleman from Washington seek recognition? <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the bill H.R. 678. Without objection. Pursuant to House Resolution 140 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for, for the consideration of H.R. 678. The Chair appoints the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Poe, to preside over the Committee of the Whole. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of H.R. 678, which the Clerk will report by title. A bill to authorize all Bureau of Reclamation conduit facilities for hydropower development under federal reclamation law and for other purposes. Pursuant to the rule, the bill is considered read the first time. The gentleman from Washington, Mr. Hastings, and the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Napolitano, each will control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington. Mr. Chairman, the, House, the committee is not in order. The House will come to order. Members take their conversations off the floor. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized for as much time as he wishes to consume. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of H.R. 678, the Bureau of Reclamation's Small Conduit Hydropower Development and Rural Jobs Act. Those of us from the Pacific Northwest know and understand the importance of hydropower and the significant role it plays in our economy. In my home state of Washington, hydropower produces 70% of our power and it helps keep electricity rates low and affordable for our residents. It is one of the cheapest and cleanest forms of electricity and helps make other intermittent sources of renewable energy like wind and solar possible. Yet too often, it is frequently the case with energy projects on federal lands, the development of new hydropower gets caught up in bureaucratic red tape and regulations. Today's bill, sponsored by our colleague from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, would cut through that red tape to expand the development of small conduit hydropower. Specifically, it clears up federal agency confusion by directly authorizing hydropower development at almost 47,000 miles of Bureau of Reclamation canals. It also streamlines the regulatory process for developing small canal and pipeline hydropower projects on existing Bureau of Reclamation facilities. Now, Mr. Chairman, I want to stress the point that these new projects will only be at existing facilities. These existing man-made facilities have already gone through extensive environmental review when they were initially built, requiring duplicative reviews on existing facilities only imposes unnecessary delays and thus administrative costs. Now, I realize that the Bureau of Reclamation has come up with its own version of streamlining since we considered this bill in the last Congress. But it's only a theoretical version of streamlining since it has never been used in the six months after it was created. 
This bill simply streamlines the regulatory administrative process so that water users can be free to develop hydropower at the federal canals they already operate and maintain. This bill will help generate thousands of megawatts of clean, cheap, abundant hydropower and thus will bring in new revenue to the federal government and more importantly, Mr. Chairman, create new American jobs. Best of all, we could do this at no cost to the American taxpayer. This is exactly the type of common sense proposal that Republicans support as part of the all of the above energy plan. Hydropower must be part of the solution. Families and small businesses rely on access to for affordable electricity and this bill is a simple way, simple way to lower prices by expanding production on one of the best forms of clean, renewable energy. Mr. Chairman, nearly identical legislation passed the House last Congress with bipartisan support. I hope the House will once again do it today and that the Senate will take action on this job-creating energy bill. I want to thank particularly uh, committee members of the Natural Resources Committee, Mr. Tipton of Colorado, Mr. Gosar of Arizona and Mr. Costa of California for their tremendous work on this bill and for being strong champions of small-scale hydro production. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I reserve my time. The gentleman from Washington reserves his time. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Napolitano, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield myself five minutes. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in support of the general premise of this bill, but oppose the legislation as is due to the inclusion of the NEPA waiver. Today we're debating H.R. 678, a bill that should be non-controversial. In fact, it should have already been enacted into law. We all agree that small uh, conduit hydropower, adding that to the uh, projects, is a great idea. No, it's really a wonderful idea. And H.R. 678 could easily have been passed through the House with overwhelming bipartisan support. But unfortunately, my esteemed colleagues on the other side have chosen to turn this non-controversial bill into a partisan fight over ideology by waiving compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act, i.e. NEPA, for federal conduit projects. As my colleague from Washington indicated, it means jobs, it means additional clean energy, it means all of those things, but to the exclusion of NEPA. As the gentleman uh, mentioned, uh, it, it, uh, H.R. 678 would amend Reclamation Project Act of 1939 and thus would facilitate and expand the private development of small conduit hydropower at the Bureau of Reclamation facilities. The legislation seeks to accomplish several goals, the most important of which is authorizing reclamation to develop and increase power at most of those facilities. H.R. 678 also includes a provision that waives NEPA for all conduit projects generating less than 5 megawatts. The bill waives NEPA, which is on page 4, lines 14 to 18, even though the Bureau of Reclamation has implemented a categorical exclusion on their own accord to apply to small conduit projects. Now, you may call it theoretical, but it's only been there six months and it takes government a long time to get the word out to those parties. The waiver of NEPA is a, contra is a bill that is unnecessary since uh, reclamation has already implemented this guidance through this categorical, categorical exclusion. The legislation seeks to solve a NEPA problem that does not exist. Unfortunately, some members on my other side of the aisle have characterized NEPA's waiver as, quote, the main purpose of this legislation. The waiver in this bill is the exact same waiver that Republicans put into the nearly identical bill last Congress. Just like the last time, the Senate won't pass it, and that bill will again expire in the Senate. It is totally unnecessary to go this effort and futility. This is not what anyone on this side of the aisle wants to see happen, and we would support the bill without the NEPA waiver. Mr. Speaker, I oppose this legislation, ask my colleagues to do the same, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlelady from California reserves her time. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to yield three minutes to the chairman of the subcommittee dealing with this legislation on the Natural Resources Committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock. The gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, is recognized for three minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the um, so-called streamlining of, that the Bureau has uh, uh, pledged to, to, to do and has done 
has produced no new projects for reasons that were made very clear to our subcommittee on water and power by numerous witnesses. NEPA is at the heart of the problem. As the chairman said, the Bureau of Reclamation operates 47,000 miles of pipelines and canals that have already undergone extensive environmental review. By installing small generators in the existing pipelines, we could add the equivalent generating capacity of major hydroelectric dams, meaning millions of dollars of new revenue to the government, millions of watts of new, clean, cheap electricity, and all the jobs these projects would produce. Uh, the general lady has said that she supports the objective and is willing to do everything that she can to help except by getting government out of the way. The federal bureaucracy has made it cost prohibitive for people to install these small generators uh, in these existing canals and pipelines. Rather, they force them to conduct crushingly expensive environmental reviews, navigate time-consuming bureaucratic mazes, uh, pay exorbitant administrative fees, and risk the uncertainties of endless internal review and external litigation. These bureaucratic obstacles often cost more than the projects themselves and turn sensible economic electricity projects into cost prohibitive farce. As proposed to be amended, this bill requires the Bureau to categorically exclude the installation of these small hydroelectric generators in existing facilities that have already undergone environmental review. It designates a central office within the Bureau to provide uniform guidance on processing applications. It establishes a sensible and streamlined process to determine development rights, and it assures that installation of hydro generators will not disrupt existing water operations. Mr. Speaker, think about the implications just of farming as one, one example. Uh, some irrigation districts are forced to use diesel generators to pump water to their fields. You put hydroelectric generators in existing canals and pipes, and they become virtually self-sustaining while reducing reliance on other sources of electricity that do produce air emissions. It's truly mystifying that a nation plagued by prolonged economic stagnation, chronic unemployment, and increasingly scarce and expensive electricity would adopt a willful and deliberate policy of obstructing the construction of these inexpensive and innocuous generators in already existing facilities. Uh, even FERC, a bastion of regulatory excess, agrees that these studies are unnecessary when conducted on similar non-federal facilities. I believe this bill is a model for the future. I hope that similar regulatory reforms uh, will soon be extended to other federal and non-federal facilities. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Washington reserves. The gentlelady from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the ranking member, Congresswoman Napolitano, for her efforts on this legislation, Chairman Doc Hastings, uh, as well as the uh, chair of the subcommittee, uh, Tom McClintock, and uh, the author of this measure, Congressman Tipton, for trying to bring folks together. Mr. Speaker, people from every walk of life are looking to Congress today to see if, if we can come together to deal with any of our problems, whether they be big, small, or in between. Uh, I rise today uh, to support legislation, I think, that does that. This isn't the biggest legislation we'll deal with this year, nor is it the smallest, but it's something that will help America's energy policy. Our bipartisan bill would amend uh, the Reclamation Act, as has been stated, of 1939, to create a permanent process for how local irrigation districts, water agencies, de develop this very valuable, renewable, carbon-free energy uh, at our reclamation facilities. And as we're putting together uh, an energy policy that uses all of the above, this becomes an important part. H.R. 678, the Bureau of Reclamation Small Conduit of Hydropower Development, and Rural Jobs Act is a bipartisan bill that puts existing resources and knowledge we already have to expand one of the most important tools in our nation's energy toolbox. Let me repeat that. One of the most important tools in our nation's energy toolbox. Hydropower is a single largest source of clean, sustainable energy and has been powering our country for over 100 years throughout the land. When most people think about hydropower, of course, they think about the big projects, Hoover Dam and other modern uh, engineering marvels. However, the beauty of this hydropower legislation is it can also be used on much smaller scaled uh, 
reliable projects in which we already have uh, the infrastructure in place. Every day, water flows thousands of miles through canals, pipes, and ditches across this country. I know I happen to represent one of those places, the Great San Joaquin Valley, in which we have a vast network of dams and reservoirs and canals that provide that water uh, for those who most need it, our cities and our farms. We have an old saying, where water flows, food grows. Every day, we miss valuable opportunities to utilize this resource's full potential. This bill changes that. This water could easily be harnessed to provide low-cost, renewable energy to American families and help add to the increment of energy that we need in this country. Currently, small conduit hydropower is largely untapped and underutilized, and it's also obviously a clean energy opportunity. The greatest barrier to unleashing the next generation of hydropower is not technological because we have made great progress on the technological side. Unfortunately, it's regulatory. Under currently, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, otherwise known as FERC, maintains jurisdiction over small projects like those that I am talking about. Serving on the Natural Resources Committee, I've heard from folks across the country that say that these regulations are too costly and too difficult to navigate. Obtaining an exception from FERC's permitting rules can take up to six months and cost nearly $50,000 for a local water district to pursue. That's unnecessary. And it's also a waste of valuable resources. Our bipartisan bill, again, would amend the Reclamation Act of 1939 to create a permanent process for how local irrigation districts and water agencies develop this very valuable, renewable, carbon-free resource for reclamation facilities. By streamlining the process, the irrigation districts would be empowered to develop small conduit hydropower at no cost to the tax taxpayers. These projects typically are five megawatts and less. Harnessing the power of water already flowing through reclamation facilities would stimulate rural economies, reduce pumping costs for farmers who face those pumping costs every year. I am proud to stand with my colleagues who are supporting this legislation. I want to thank Congressman Tipton for this effort because it helps us take advantage of existing facilities that are already in place to provide additional resource of power where we need it. If we want to strengthen our energy portfolio, let's start with the low-hanging fruit. This is low-hanging fruit. Let me just give you some numbers. In California, there are 20 small hydro projects, should this legislation become law, that would be available to this process. Let me underline that. 20 projects in California that would qualify. In the nation, the Bureau of Reclamation has determined that there are 373, 373 projects throughout the country that potentially would qualify should this legislation become law. The bill does just that. I urge your support for H.R. 678. General from California yields back his time. The gentlelady from California reserves her time. The gentleman from Washington is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to yield five minutes to the uh, sponsor of this bipartisan legislation, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hastings, for yielding, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. H.R. 678 is a common-sense piece of legislation to foster clean, renewable energy development, create rural jobs in America, and to do so without taxpayer cost, while returning revenues to the U.S. Treasury, and by all measures should be considered low-hanging fruit, as our fellow member has just noted, for congressional action. There's been a lot of discussion on both sides of the aisle about the need to be able to pursue an all-of-the-above strategy. Hydropower as the cleanest and most abundant natural energy source should be at the forefront of any comprehensive national energy policy. Increased condu conduit hydropower serves a number of purposes. It produces renewable and emissions-free energy that can be used to pump water or sell electricity into the grid. It can generate revenue for the irrigation district to be able to help pay for aging infrastructure costs and facilitate modernization. And it can create local jobs and generate revenue to the federal government. It's as simple as this poster demonstrates, as easy as putting a portable generator into a, a moving canal water. 
Many irrigation districts and electrical utilities seek to develop hydropower on Bureau of Reclamation pipes, ditches, and canals. But regulatory uncertainty and the threat of unnecessary bureaucratic requirements stand in the way. This legislation seeks to remove duplicative environmental analysis, where doing so will considerably reduce costs for hydropower developers while retaining, while retaining the analysis necessary to protect valuable natural resources. While the Bureau of Reclamation has recently begun to inventory facilities suitable for small conduit hydropower generation and develop directives and standards to help promote that end, for far too long, duplicative review for small hydropower projects on existing man-made facilities rendered these projects financially unfeasible, and significant uncertainty still remains. The generating units covered by H.R. 678 would be installed on entirely man-made waterways, which have already received a full environmental review when they were built or rehabilitated. Any transmission associated with these projects would result from the passage of this bill must still undergo full environmental review where they impact the environment. To require a lengthy review for, by dropping a small generator into a pipe simply defies logic. And we cannot pursue an all of the above energy strategy if we continue business as usual. In addition to creating regulatory certainty and removing duplicative processes, this legislation authorizes power development at the agency's conduits to clear up multi-federal agency confusion and further reduces the regulatory costs associated with hydropower development. This provision of the bill will provide the necessary statutory authority to be able to reduce litigation that the agency is sure to seek under the current framework, which relies on broad authorities that do not specifically authorize hydropower development. This legislation ensures the continued use of the Bureau facilities, primarily for water supply and irrigation, and protects the interests of those maintaining and operating these facilities by offering them the first right of refusal to take advantage of small conduit energy development projects. Non-federal operators know the details of the facilities best and are locally invested. As a result, it's only logical to offer them the first opportunity to develop this energy on facilities that they maintain. Additionally, those irrigation districts with pre-existing arrangements with the Bureau or the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for Water Delivery and Hydropower Development will not be disturbed by this bill. I'm proud to have the support of the Family Farm Alliance, the National Water Resources Association, the American Public Power Association, and the National Hydropower Association, among others. I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to be able to make this public law and to start putting rural America back to work and developing clean, renewable energy. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman from uh, Colorado yields back his time. The gentlelady from uh, California. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I agree with my colleague, um, except some of those projects were built in 1902 and through 1970s. I think we do need NEPA uh, protection. I would like to yield five minutes to uh, Congressman Swalwell from California. And from California is recognized. Thank you, and I'd like to thank the ranking member for yielding me the time. And Ms. Chair, I rise to object today to the consideration of this bill and rather uh, propose that we stand in this House and we consider Mr. Hoyer's Make It in America package. We can come together and focus on real solutions that will get our economy moving again. And we should take up Mr. Hoyer's Make It in America package because it will strengthen our economy and create non-outsourceable jobs here at home in America. The Make It in America package includes bills like mine, H.R. 1022, the Securing Energy Critical Elements and American Jobs Act of 2013 that will help secure America's place as a leader in science and technology with a 21st century workforce. What are rare earth elements? Well, these are 17 chemical elements, elements that prior to coming to Congress and learning about how they affect our economy, I couldn't point out at pistol point. But they are very critical to making cell phones, to making our electric cars, and also to making our anti-missile systems. Despite the name, they are very abundant in our country, and they can be extracted in an environmentally safe manner. So what's the problem? Well, today, 97% of rare earth elements are extracted and exported from China, 80% of rare earth magnets, and almost 100% of related metal production are coming from China. In 2010, China temporarily cut off rare earth supplies to Japan, the European Union, 
and the United States, highlighting the potential consequences to the United States for relying so heavily upon China for rare earth production that is so crucial and critical to what we can create here in America. My district includes northern Silicon Valley, home of silicon chip processing, home of the technology boom, home of the internet, and also home of many advanced manufacturing production sites. H.R. 1022, the Securing Energy Critical Elements in American Jobs Act of 2013, aims to help reduce our dependence on China for these critical elements and instead make it here in America. But in order for us to do this, we need to invest in developing our technical workforce here at home. Currently, the United States lacks the necessary technical expertise to ensure a reliable supply of energy critical elements. My bill, H.R. 1022, enlists the talents of our university students and encourages them to develop the technical expertise necessary to secure America's access to these elements. We need to ensure that the best and brightest minds in our area, in our country, have the tools and support they need to support America's access to energy critical elements. H.R. 1022 will promote collaboration and research opportunities in the fields of energy ener critical elements for students at higher institutions and coordination of federal agencies to promote a stable supply of energy critical elements. We also have in my congressional district what's called the Tri-Valley, or as I like to call it, the I-Valley, the Innovation Valley. This area also would rely upon energy critical elements. And as the ranking member said, we have an opportunity today to work in a bipartisan fashion, and unfortunately, I do not see us doing that. So I would conclude by asking that we come together. And also in my bill, uh, there's a loan guarantee for companies with new processing and refining technologies the Securing Energy Critical Elements and American Jobs Act of 2013 will help to spur private investment in companies on the forefront of this critical field. It's very important that we have the federal government at the very inception and the beginning providing the research and federal funding, but most importantly is to get it out into the private industry, and that's what this bill calls upon. So again, I urge my colleagues to stop wasting time with partisan bills like this today. Instead, let's come together to train and secure a 21st century workforce. Let's harness our own resources. Let's make it in America, and we can help all Americans make it. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from California yields back his time.